Welcome to this episode of the JF Media Show. Again, once again, uh, my name is Calvin Cavanda. I am your host for today. And today we are going to be doing a book review. I think it will turn into uh, a series of a few episodes. And I got this book from a friend. And at first I was like, uh, you know, back in 2020, when I really decided to recommit, 2019, when I decided to recommit my life to Christ, uh, up to the point I had read two, I read a lot of books about um, secular wisdom, secular knowledge, uh, a lot of self-help books. A lot of, you know, books that, you know, people normally would rush to and read, you know, the souls, you know, the top shot people in the world, right? So those are the people who used to motivate me. In fact, I used to call them my idols, uh, my role models and things of that nature. But in 2020, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to. I'm not going to read any other book until I finish reading the Bible. And to be honest, it's been like, it's going, it's going on four years. And it just, that decision, I remember that time I went and counseled all the books that I had read, you know, I had on my reading list. I used to have like 50 books on my reading list every year. I used to read a lot of books, all the books, you know, I'll go and find out, you know, the, the, the top CEOs, the top people, you know, the, you know, the people who are, you know, killing it in the world, you know, people who are at the top of the, you know, the food chain and, and all of that. And, and, and that used to be my MO. And so I would go and find out all the books that they were reading and, and all of that. And I'll, you know, I'll have them in my own, you know, put them on my own reading list. So. But my life was changed when I made a decision to say, I'm not going to read any other book until I finish reading the Bible. Um, since then, I can testify that what the Bible did is that I found out that all the knowledge, the wisdom in the world is actually rooted in the Word of God. I, it was mind blowing. All the colloquialisms we we use in the world all the phrases all the you know things like you know uh going in with a firm handshake i found these a lot of these things all these things were god's code of conduct so anyways i told myself i'm not going to read any other book until i finish reading the bible and it's been four years I started to venture out to read some other books that are faith and spiritually inspired by the Bible. I started to venture out into reading some of those books, you know. I just, um, you know, some people that might have, uh, that might be blessed by the Lord to, to, to have a different way to convey uh, messages that are in the Bible through uh, everyday living. So there's a few books I started to read. And, and so when a friend of mine came and told me, hey, we actually did a book, book exchange. It's a book that I gave him how to find, follow, and fulfill God's purpose for your life. Uh, that's a book by Andrew Womack, a man who, when I recommitted my life to, to the Lord, he was one of the people who ignited that, who ignited uh train trucks that I decided to follow and then he gave me this book so uh, he gave me that I had the book with me and so he came by I gave him this book because he was still in a place where he was like man you know I don't know what I really want to do what God has called me to do so like wow perfect time he's a book for you and so he also gave me a book called healing for damaged emotions by David A. 
Simmons. Healing for Damaged Emotions by David A. Simmons. Now it says over 1 million in print. This book was published in, wow, 2015. So it's been around for some time. Actually, no. Um, was it? Yeah. Okay, I think it was first, probably it was first, I see two copyrights, 1981 and 2015. I don't know if that means it was first printed in 1981 and then 2015. But anyways, yeah, so... Healing for Damaged Emotions uh, by David A. Simmons. I thought that this would be interesting. Uh, you and I get to go through some literature. And, you know, I'm pretty sure we shall be inspired uh, by the Holy Ghost. You know, because there's a lot of some things in there that I'm like, wow, this is this is some really good stuff. Things that you and I should probably... Uh, remind ourselves, you know. So, first of all, how are you doing today? I do hope you are doing well. I do hope you're doing well. I do hope you're doing well. And if you're not, as I like to always start up every segment of our show by praying for us, because we are going to be dealing with, we're going to be seeking divine insight that can help us understand the mysteries uh coming to the knowledge of the mysteries of christ and 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 for you and i's uh for our lives to be transformed that is, that is why we're here so father in the name of jesus i invite the presence of the holy spirit into this atmosphere onto these airwaves i ask that your holy spirit will attach uh his power his utterance to this frequency, to your voice as you speak through me. I ask that uh, whoever is listening in this room where this is being recorded and whoever is listening wherever they are, I ask that you create a Holy Ghost bubble around them uh, where they are. Our eyes will be opened. Our ears will be opened to hear. Our eyes will be opened to see. And our hearts will also be opened to receive uh, this engrafted word with meekness that is able to save our souls. In Jesus' mighty name, we do pray. Amen. Now, I wanted to start off by laying some scripture, you know, just scripture ballpark. I, I always like to do that. I, I, I man, um, whether it's prayer, whether it's, you know, these recordings, any discussion, I think we need to get in the, in the mindset of always inviting scripture to kind of give us uh, a ballpark of, of where to play, of, of, of where to let the Holy Ghost uh, inspire us. I think it's very important. So, and... Honestly, I just read some things. I was like, I was reading this book. I was like, hey, how about I do like a book study or like a book review? Go with some really interesting things. And I, last minute, I asked the Holy Ghost. I was like, hey, Holy Spirit, what scriptures should we use to kind of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, get our minds rolling? So if you know any better ones, you can, you're always welcome to send them to me. Uh, by the way, this show is is live on YouTube, but you can also access it on Spotify and other um, recordings, other uh, podcast hosting platforms. So um, this is the J A E F Media Show 
I know when I just say JF show, someone might must say like, yeah, what you know, they may not be able to find it, but it's the J A E F Media Show. So once again, this is the J A E F Media Show, the Jesus and Everything Foundation Media Show. Why? Because I believe this show was inspired um that it should have that we should have a biblical worldview, first of all. But not only that, I believe best on First Corinthians, no, uh, Colossians. <clears throat> excuse me. Colossians chapter one says something that is really the reason as to why this show is called the Jesus and Everything Foundation Show. No matter what the subject is, we're always going to look at it through the lens of Jesus, and here's why. You know, most people like to eliminate the God factor. But I, li I like to say, no, the God factor is involved in everything because of this scripture. It says, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, starting from verse 15, says, He is the image of the invisible God, talking about Jesus Christ, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So one of the things we, whether it's wisdom, whether it's knowledge, so in the scripture that talks about whether things that are in heaven or in the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, all things were created by him and through him all things exist, right? All things are created through him and for him, and he is before all things and in him all things consist. So knowledge, what you might call, no matter what dimension of knowledge, whether it's in the natural realm, in the physical realm, or in the spiritual realm, Christ had something to do with it. So. This is what I've decided, that I'm going to let my thinking be inspired by the Spirit of Christ, by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. It says, in the beginning, before the foundation of the world, he had the blueprint. And now we understand the fall of man came and all of that. And I, I'm not trying to get into that right now. But I just want to challenge you who's listened to these. If this is your first time ever listening to this, if you can to listen to this book review and you're like, yeah, just give me the book review. No, I, I like to give context of why this show exists. What is the premise? Through what lens do we operate? What is our uh, MO, modus operandi? It's Christ, 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 Christ. So. Some scriptures to, um, you know, lubricate our thinking as we're going to get into the book. So I'll just read them. Sometimes you just read scripture and then, you know, activate the power of the Holy Ghost with you. So some, 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 since we're going to be talking about healing for damaged emotions, you know, scripture talks a lot about emotions. Scripture has so much to say about emotions, you know. But it, our emotions and our soul faculty, you know. In First Thessalonians chapter 5 to 23 says, let, let me bring that. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 23 says, it says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, also, who also will do it. So he talks about a sanctification on three levels for us as human beings. Your whole spirit, your whole soul, and your body. And it says, completely, in 3 John chapter 2, third episode of John, chapter, 3 John, 3 John, 
verse 2. Because there's only one chapter in 3 John. So 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in hell, just as your soul prospers. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. What he's telling us here is that we cannot be, we cannot prosper and be in health beyond the prosperity of our soul. Now, the soul, um, let me bring in another scripture here, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11 says, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's telling us that the word of God is what we can use. It's so sharp. It is so fine. Soul and spirit. And that's why it's the, the scripture here is saying to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Soul and spirit can sometimes be um, I want to put a bookmark up. Soul and spirit can sometimes be so in they they it almost feels like they're so they're so similar. So when you talk to a lot of people, they think we're just a body and we have a soul. And so they think when you die, you know, the 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 memories and all of that, they think it's just that's immaterial. They think it stops there. But scripture is telling us that piercing even to the dividing asunder that the word of God can separate spirit from soul. So they, 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 they are very close, but they're different. They almost sound similar, but they're different. So in our soul faculty is where we find our mind, our will, and our emotions. This is why I'm picking up a lot of scriptures that they don't explicitly say emotions, but it talks a lot about the soul. The soul is that faculty that is the mind, the will, and the emotions. Now, Third John is telling us that I pray. Beloved, I pray above all that you may prosper and be in health, even, oh, let me find it here. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. It's telling us that we cannot prosper in our health. And other realms of prosperity it is tied to how much our soul prospers. And what this book was, was is, is, is further reinforcing is that a lot of Christians are not prospering in other areas of their lives. Their marriage, their finances, their relationships, because their soul has damaged emotions in there. So there are some things that I was like, wow, I didn't even know that. In essence of, of how it tries to bring more awareness to, to what damaged emotions look like. So there's a lot of scripture that I'm using that will, will be using the phrase soul. But remember, within our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. It's all within the soul faculty. So, off we go. Psalm, Psalm 42 verse 5 says, This is 
you know, when we're talking about emotions, um, let me first read the, the back of the book. It says your past doesn't have to hurt your present. It says events in our lives, both good and bad, form rings in us, like the rings in a tree. I didn't even, I didn't even know that what the rings in the tree stand for, what they mean. That was something new for me to find out. It says each ring records memories that affect our feelings, our relationships, and our thoughts about God. In this classic work, David Simmons encourages us to live compassionately with ourselves as we allow the Holy Spirit to heal our past, as he helps us name hurdles in our lives, such as guilt, poor self-worth, and perfectionism. He shows us how we can find freedom from our pain and enjoy the abundant life God wants for us. So the, le the, the late David Simmons was a pastor, missionary, professor, emeritus, and counselor in residence at Asbury Theological Seminary. He authored several books, including Putting Away Childish Things, Freedom from the Performance Trap, and If Only. So, David Simmons will continue to drink from the wells of salvation that he left for us. Okay, so, makes sense. The first print of this book was 1981, and then I, I believe we printed in 2015. But let me let me read out some scriptures here, and, and then we can get rolling. Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water brooks. Psalm 42. Let's go right there. It says, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. Then I like this part. Something happened. Because when I remember these things, they pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept the pilgrim feast. It says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Then he goes on to say, O oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan and from the heights of Hamon, from the hill Mizar. Deep calls unto deep. At the noise of your waterfalls, all your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night. His song shall be with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Isn't that, isn't that a cry that many of us have? Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? There's a lot of oppression, depression that, that, that's, that happens to us because of damaged emotions. Things that have been stacked inside us that we need to pull out. We need to just go in there and scrape from the bottom of our hearts. Then it says, as with the breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me, while they said to me all the day long, where is your God? 
you know what that can be? That can be mental mental health. That can be past trauma happening to you and I that keeps knocking on the door saying to us all the day long, where is your God? But so all of these things have happened to him. Some of the bad memories and what has happened is the countenance within him, his soul is cast down. There's a depression that he's going through. Then verse 11, he finishes up by saying, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. He's saying, all of these things have happened. Now he's saying, on the inside, there's, there's a depression, there's a cave that there's a darkness in there of things that have happened that his soul is 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 is, is, is the countenance of his soul is downward because of things that are in there that just are pulling it down and then he continues in Psalm 43, why are you cast down? Psalm 43, verse 5, why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. So we're seeing a posture of someone who's deeply hurt. Um... Another one, come here, there's, there's another interesting one for betrayal. There's, there's another one where, um, let me, let me quickly find it. There's another one about betrayal, and you'll see the picture. I gotta, I gotta quickly find it here. Yeah, Psalms 55. The pattern of betrayal, past, present, and future. Uh, let's, let's, let's go there. Hey, you know, but you know, one thing that I, I read in scripture is, first of all, the Holy Ghost is dropping this light. So I hope some fire. Because what, what I really like about it is it paints a picture for someone who's, yeah, trust in God concerning the treachery of friends. Then I they go. So there's a psalm I'm looking for. Um, David, David was writing about someone who betrayed him. Let me see, is it, is it this one? Help me, Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the phrase is one, one that I used to eat with. One that I used to eat with betrayed me. Psalms, Psalm 41. Thank you, Holy Spirit.
Psalm 41. Yeah, well, Psalm 41, uh, verse 9 to 10 says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. So, anyways, Psalm 63. That's, a, that's another one that I want to use for context. Psalm 63. Psalm 63. That was another one the Holy Spirit put on my heart. Okay. It says, O oh God, you are my God. Ali will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Then in verse 5, it says, my soul shall be satisfied as with now as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Verse eight. My soul follows close behind you, your right hand upholds me. Okay. Now we sing uh, a posture of someone whose soul is panting. Now, listen to what Isaiah 61 is. There's a phrase there that I want us to. This is, Jesus quoted this in Luke chapter 4. Isaiah 61. Listen to Jesus' manifesto. It says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He quoted this in Luke chapter 4 verse 18 when he went to the synagogue. This was his manifesto. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Listen to what the areas that he's talking about. And I'll bring your attention. We'll see something to do with our emotions. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has, uh, has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Damaged emotions. And then to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And then it says, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the gamut of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Wow. Listen, after this happens to them, then in verse 4 he says, And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall now raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. But that comes after a certain uh, dimension of healing is administered to them to console those who are in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning. It says the gamut of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The gamut of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The gamut of praise for the spirit of heaviness. My goodness. Remember, 3 John 2 told us that, beloved, I pray above all things. And let me just read it from the King from the King James. It renders a bit, it renders it a bit differently, but it says, "Beloved, I wish above all things that you you may prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. That you may prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers." So. Jesus' manifesto comes on the scene and says, one of the things that I want to deal with is deal with those who are brokenhearted. He said, Isaiah 61 verse 1, 
He said, he has sent me to do what one of the things that Jesus was, was sent was to heal the brokenhearted. And we can agree, the damaged emotions are in there. That's, that's part of the, that's part of the uh, manifesto that Jesus came with. That's part of the manifesto that Jesus came with. Part of my my lighting. So one of the things that I, I want to share with you is in Luke chapter when Jesus was Killed the paralytic man. There's a phrase there that I want you and I to be very, very aware. No. Where is that? Jesus forgives and heals a paralytic. Yeah. In in Luke chapter 5, I, I want to let you in on a mystery. You see, I don't want you to think that this is just an ordinary sit down. You know, I may not be, uh, may not look very animated right now because I'm also, I'm just going with the flow of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, as Christians, one of the things that has really helped me is most Christians only have one gear, fast-paced and loud. Like, like, like I mean, these, the, you, you got to have moments where you just know how to interface with the Holy Ghost. You know, you know, you know, there's, there's moments when you just let the Holy Ghost do his work on you and you almost like you just sit back and let the presence of the Holy Spirit come in and just sit and brood over you. So as we're sharing the word of God, I want to release a revelation. Well, maybe you already know this. In Luke chapter 5, when Jesus forgives and heals the paralytic, it says, Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. He says, And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. But guess what was happening before? They were, it was teaching. So anytime that you and I gather around to, 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 to hear the living word of God, you and I should have an expectation that the power of God is present to heal us. So by faith, Holy Ghost, I'm trusting that as we're diving into scripture and talking about healing for our damaged emotions, that the power of God is present over these airwaves to heal whoever needs healing. I, I, I'm not here just so that you can just listen and just have another. I'm not here to waste your time. I don't want to waste your time. I value your time. But I, I'm, I'm mentioning these that I want you by faith to tune in and open up your heart. The reason I'm giving some of those scriptures is to bring some spiritual understanding to you as we start to journey deep into this book. Is one of, one of the things Jesus was anointed to do was to heal the brokenhearted. To open the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim liberty to the captives. So if there's any area in your life that you're feeling that you've been dealing with some things for a really long time. Have the expectation that the power of God is present right now, here and now, to heal us. The power of God is present to heal us. Okay? so. I just want to let you know how scripture works. It's not that 
as we're going along, have that expectation that the power of God is present to heal right now. So Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, I, I, I decree and declare by faith that your power is present to heal anyone that is listening to this, that has been dealing with any emo with any damaged emotion. Lord, I pray that you will bring these things to the surface, to our, you said, I will leave you with a comforter and he will show you all things that I have taught you. Uh, the Holy Ghost will teach us all things. He'll bring all things to our remembrance. Any area that we, that we have damaged emotions that we have never even realized. I pray that as we have this conversation, me and my brothers and sisters, that Lord, your power starts to unveil these areas of our lives. Bring them to our understanding. Bring them to our memory right now. Bring them to the forefront of our mind. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Anyways. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, you and I are just having a good time over scripture and a book review. So, the power of God was present to heal him. Anyways, we've also discussed that one of Jesus on in Jesus' manifesto, one of the things was to heal the brokenhearted. That has been from Isaiah 61. So let me give you another one. And then off we go. John chapter 14, verse 15 to 18. It's very interesting. You'll see something there. The Gospel of John. Chapter 14, verse 15 to 18. I'm reading from the King James. It says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwells with you, and shall be in you. And then in verse 26, he goes on to say, this is the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14. I just read verse 15 to 18. Actually, 18, I didn't read 18. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Hmm. And then he comes down to verse 26 and says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Then he says, Peace I live with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let your heart not be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We're talking about emotions here. The Comforter. The word Comforter is also translated, I like how the kingdom says the Comforter. It says, it's also, uh, in, in the Greek, it's Paraclete, another of the same kind. But I want you to hear how it talks about uh, the Comforter in the Amplified Classic. The, the, the definitions, the, the attributes of the comforter. It says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter. It says, counselor, it says counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and standby. So there's seven areas that when we receive the Holy Spirit in us, with us, you know, like with us, in us, the seven things that the Holy Spirit can do for us. 
He's a counselor. Guess what? Many times people are going to psych uh, psych psychiatrists and I mean, psychologists and, and we ignore the fact that the Holy Spirit is a counselor. It says a helper. It says an intercessor, an advocate, a strengthener, a standby. Strengthens us in moments when we feel weak. When we can't rely on our emotions, when we feel like our emotions are... Um, this is all areas of the Holy Spirit. If we allow him, he goes in and touches us and does work on us. Wow. So, with that frame of mind, let us read a few things and then, yeah, we shall, we shall be doing reading more of the book as we go along. So, chapter one, damaged emotions. I'm just going to be reading some parts, we'll discuss and, you know, just, just you and I, just going to have a good time. But remember, the power of God right now is available and present to heal you. Wherever you need healing, activate your faith. Set your expectation. All right? Okay, damaged emotions. One Sunday evening in 1966, I preached a sermon called The Holy Spirit and the Healing of Our Damaged Emotions. It was my first venture into this area. And I was convinced that God had given me that message or I would never have had the courage to preach it. What I said that evening about the healing of memories and damaged emotions is now old hat. You'll find it in a lot of books. But it wasn't old then. Hallelujah. When I got up to preach, I looked down at the congregation and saw dear old Dr. Smith. Now, Dr. Smith had been a very real part of my boyhood when my wife Helen and I first heard that we were appointed to a prison. A pastorate, a few elderly faces appeared in our minds to trouble us. Dr. Smith was one of them. For I wondered how I could even minister to him. He had he had nearly he had nearly scared the life out of me with his preaching when I was young, and I was still uneasy in his presence. When I saw him in the congregation that evening, my heart sunk. But I went ahead and preached the message that I felt God had given me after the service which followed was the what which after the service, which was followed by a very wonderful time for many at the prayer altar, Dr. Smith remained seated in the congregation. I was busy praying with people at the altar, but somewhere in the back of my mind, I was also praying that Dr. Smith would leave. <laughs> oh, this is very interesting. Okay. I was praying that Dr. Smith would leave. He didn't. He came up to the altar and in his own inimitably gruff way, he said, David, may I see you in your office? All those images from the pastor rose and the frightened little boy inside of me followed the old man. As I sat down in my office, I felt somewhat like Moses must have before the fire and the smoke of Sinai. But I was so wrong about him. I hadn't allowed for change. I had frozen him at one stage and hadn't let him grow. Very kindly, Dr. Smith said to me, David, I've never heard of someone quite like that before. But I want to tell you something. His eyes got moist. He had been an outstanding evangelist and preacher for many years and had won thousands to Christ. He was truly a great man, but as he looked back over his own ministry, he said, You know, there was always a group of people I could never help. They were sincere people. I believe many of them were spirit-filled Christians, but they had problems. They brought these things to me and I tried to help. But no amount of advice, no amount of scripture or prayer on their part ever seemed to bring them lasting deliverance. Then he said, I always felt guilty in my ministry. David, 
but I think you're onto something. Work on it, develop it. Please keep preaching it, for I believe what you've found is the answer. When he rose to leave, my eyes were wet as I said, Thank you, doctor. But most of all, I was inwardly saying, Thank you, God, for your affirmation through this dear man. Wow. Now, I realize I should have read um, the preface, because I think it's really unique. Okay, rewind. Let's go to the preface. Early in my pastoral experience, I discovered that I was failing to help two groups of people through the regular ministries of the church. Their problems were not being solved by the preaching of the word, commitment to Christ, the filling of the spirit, prayer, or the sacraments. I saw one group being driven into futility and loss of confidence in God's power. While they desperately prayed, their prayers about personal problems didn't seem to be answered. They tried every Christian discipline, but with no results. As they played the same old cracked record of their defects, the needle would get stuck in repetitive emotional patterns. While they kept up the upward observances of praying and praying and profess of praying and paying and professing, they were going deeper and deeper into disillusionment and despair. I saw the other group moving toward phoniness. These people were repressing their inner feelings and denying that anything was seriously wrong. Because Christians, because Christians can't have such problems. Instead of facing their problems, they covered them with a veneer of scripture verses, theological terms, and unrealistic platitudes. They denied problems. The denied problems went underground only to let it reappear in all manner of illness, eccentricities, terribly unhappy marriages, and sometimes even in the emotional destruction of their children. Well, during this time of discovery, God showed me that the ordinary ways of ministering would never help some problems. And he began to enable me to open up my heart to personal self-discovery and to new depths of healing, love, through my marriage, my children, and intimate friends. Hallelujah. This is awesome. So, what is the problem? Again, this is uh, you and I to be reminded about some of these things. Okay. He's preached the first sermon on the Holy Spirit and the healing of our damaged emotions. The problem, over the years, letters and testimonies from across the world have confirmed that there is a realm of problems that requires a special kind of prayer and a deeper level of healing by the Spirit. Somewhere between our sins on the one hand and our sicknesses on the other lies an area the scripture calls infirmities. Hmm. Infirmities. We can explain this by an illustration from nature. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all a bunch of reading and I'll be finally expounding on certain things that the Holy Spirit um, uh, jumped off the page for me. So, but I want to give you some context. This is the first uh, episode of this uh, book, re book series, book review. Um, he says, somewhere between our sins on one hand and our sicknesses on the other lies an area the scripture calls infirmities. We can explain this by an illustration from nature. If you visit, this is something I didn't know. I was like, wow. So we can explain this by an illustration from nature. If you visit the Western United States, 
you will see the beautiful giant sequoia and redwood trees. In most of the parks, the naturalists can show you a cross section of a great tree they have cut, and they will point out that the rings of the tree reveal the, develop the developmental history year by year. Here's a ring that represents a year when there was a terrible drought. Here are a couple of rings from years when there was too much rain. Here is where the tree was struck by lightning. Wow, I didn't even know this. Here are some normal years of growth. The ring shows a forest fire that almost destroyed the tree. Here's another of the savage blight and disease. All of this lies embedded in the heart of the tree, representing the autobiography of its growth. That's the way it is with us. Just a few thin layers beneath the protective bark, the concealing, protective mask, are the recorded rings of our lives. I didn't know that. And I was amazed and saying, wow, if God can put such create trees with such intelligence, how, how much more us human beings? I truly believe, and I used to be in a place where I thought that baptize them with the Holy Ghost, fill them with the Spirit, more prayer, more fasting will solve that problem. But no. There's, and there's some things, there's some problems, as Third John say, that you may prosper in, and be in health even as thy soul prospers. There's certain things that we can't truly tap into the power of God until our soul is, until we have a healthy soul. A healthy soul means a healthy mind, a healthy will. And healthy emotions. But this was amazing to find out that trees have their own autobiography. Wow. Anyways, it says there are scars of ancient. It says this is the way it is with us. Just a few thin layers beneath the protective bark, the concealing protective mask are the recorded rings of our lives. These are scars of ancient painful hearts. As when a little boy rushed downstairs one Christmas dawn and discovered in his Christmas stocking a dirty old rock. Put there to punish him for some trivial boyhood not naughtiness. This scar has eaten away at him, causing all kinds of interpersonal difficulties. Hmm. Here is the discoloration of a tragic stain that muddied all of life. As as years ago behind the barn or in the haystack or out in the woods, a big brother took a little sister and introduced her to the mysteries. No, the mysteries of sex. And here we see the pressure of a painful repressed memory of, a, of, of running after an alcoholic father who was about to kill the mother and then of rushing for the butcher knife. Such scars have been buried in pain for so long that they are causing heart and rage that are inexplicable. And these scars are not touched by conversation and sanctifying grace or by the ordinary benefits of prayer. I agree. Let me just... Um, well, wow. says in the rings of our thoughts and emotions, the, the record is there. The memories are recorded and all are alive. And they directly and deeply affect our concepts of feelings in our relationships. They affect the way we look at life and God, at others and ourselves. We preachers, th this is very key. This is very, very key. It says, we preachers often give people the mistaken idea that the new birth and being filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit are going to automatically 
take care of these emotional hangups. But this just isn't true. A great crisis experience of Jesus Christ, as important and eternally valuable as this is, is not a shortcut to emotional health. It is not a quickie cure for personality problems. Mm. And for compassion, this really challenged me for compassion. This causes you to have compassion on people. Listen to this. It is necessary that we understand this, first of all, so that we can compassionately live with ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to work with special healing in, in our own hearts and confusion. We also need to understand this in order to not judge other people too harshly, but to have patience with their confusing and contradictory behavior. In so doing, we will be kept from unfairly criticizing and judging fellow Christians. They are not fakes, phonies, or hypocrites. They are people like you and me, with hearts and scars and wrong programming that interferes with their present behavior. Understanding that salvation does not give instant emotional health offers us an important insight into the doctrine of sanctification. Remember in 1 Thessalonians where I say, uh, where I read 5.23, that may the God of hope, let me quickly go back there, yeah, sanctify you wholly, spirit, soul, and body. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Why is it calling him the God of peace? Shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken. The original Hebrew, shalom, means all-encompassing word. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Shalom is, is a wholeness to a person, not just physically. It's physically, financially, with your friends, mentally, socially. It's an all it's a rich word that is talking about wholeness in every area of your life. Nothing missing, nothing broken. But he's saying, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls his faithful, who also will do it. And here he's saying this understanding that once you get born again, automatically there's a deposit. You know, in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, I think, yes. It says, For the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. So once the Holy Spirit comes, the first work he starts to do, he sheds the love of God abroad in your heart. One of the one of the things that that does, is because here he's talking about that understanding this, understanding that salvation does not give instant emotional health, instant emotional health. The health eventually comes, but he's telling you it is not instant emotional health. It says offers an important insight into the doctrine of sanctification, because I believe when that when the love of God is not shed abroad in your heart. One of the things, one of the procedures, uh, prescriptions given for healing damaged emotions talks about being able to receive forgiveness and being able to forgive. And it's very interesting because in the current series we're doing, Let There Be Light, in our last segment from Songs of Songs, chapter 1, we see this, this, the, the shepherd king and the Shulamite woman trying to tell him that she is broken. And, and he's looking at her saying, come as you are. She's, she's talking about all the good things about him. 
and he's love and he's this and he's that, but she cannot receive it. In in first in first John chapter four, it says we love him because he first loved us. It says we love him because he first loved us. First John. Let me find that. First John chapter four. Four nineteen. It says we love him because he first loved us. So when the and one of the things, one of the dimensions. Thank you, Holy Ghost. In First John chapter four, when it's talking about the love of God and paints his pictures, and one of the things that we see from his love was that he forgave us even when we were yet still sinners, says it even in Ephesians. He paid the price for us. So forgiveness is one of the attributes of God's love. And so here, when we understand that when a person becomes born again, the reasons why we can't jump to the gun and say, why, why are you acting this way? This person is, you know, this person is not going to pull the socks out. This person is not, you know, we, we can be so quick to judge them because we don't understand that there is a certain sanctification in the soul that happens. And the love of God, as Roman tells us, that it should have brought in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, when it's activated, one of the empowerments that it gives us is to forgive. The love of God teaches us how to love like God. So we need that. Healing of damaged emotions, which involves receiving God's forgiveness and giving love to others. Receiving his forgiveness that you're forgiven from your sins and not walking around in condemnation. But there's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Likewise, it's a two-way street. There's two things. You receive it, but then you must also learn how to forgive others. Do you see that? So when 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 David says Understanding that salvation does not give instant emotional health offers us an important insight into the doctrine of sanctification. Some people think that sanctification is a process that takes one week. And this is, my, this is one of the issues I have with people that think that we have a shorter leash with God on the inside than we had with him on the outside. No. Even when we tell people God loves prostitutes, God loves murderers, God loves people, when we, when we tell, when we're saying that all of us have been fallen and shot of the glory of God, once we come into the kingdom, if deep cleansing doesn't happen, and, and, and in, the, in the soul realm, we are prone to fall back into old vices, and also we are prone to have a slow Christian growth rate. So he's saying it helps us in understanding the doctrine of sanctification. He says it is impossible to know how Christian a person is merely on the basis of his outward behavior. Okay? Isn't it true that by their fruits you shall know them? Listen to this. This was really good. Isn't it true? We always quote the scripture. Oh, by their fruits you shall know them. Yeah. Yes, but it is also true that by their roots you shall understand and not judge them. I was like, wow. That's profound. We always quote, by their fruits you shall know them. But he's challenging our thinking and saying, yes, it is also true Yes, but it is also true that, bear, that by their roots, he shall understand and not judge them. Over here is John, who may appear to be more spiritual and responsible as a Christian than Bill. So he's going to give us two examples of two people. And you might be quick to judge one and put down another. 
Because over here is John, who may appear to be more spiritual and responsible as a, as a Christian than Bill. But actually, considering John's roots and the good kind of soil he had to grow in and out of, Bill may be a saint by comparison. He may have had much more progress than John in really being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. How wrong, how unchristian to superficially judge people. Some may object, what are you doing? Lowering standards? Are you denying the power of the Holy Spirit to heal our hangups? Are you trying to give up to give us a cop out for responsibility so that we can blame life or heredity or parents or teachers or sweethearts or mates for our defeats and failures? In the words of Paul, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And I would answer as Paul answered that question, God forbid. What I'm saying is that certain areas of our lives need special healing by the Holy Spirit. Because they are not subject to ordinary prayer, discipline, and willpower, they need a special kind of understanding and unlearning of past wrong programming and a relearning and a reprogramming transformation by the renewal of our minds. And this is not done overnight by a crisis experience. Wow. Wow. That's really good. That's really good. So, based on what Jesus told us in his manifesto, he said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. You can see the areas that God was talking about. All of this was in the facet of spirit and soul. Because once spirit and soul is free, it manifests in the natural. So, that was exciting. I feel like I'm going to, you know, segue uh, I mean just kind of round it up here uh, but that was really interesting so remember that when you look at two Christians that's a big takeaway for us is yes by their fruits you shall know them but also by their roots you shall understand and not judge them Let me round us off in prayer here and um, pray for pray for healing of damaged emotions. And uh, we shall continue to segue through this book, to 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 sojourn through this book, healing for damaged emotions. There's a lot of good things that you and I can learn from it. And uh, I'm just going to be sharing some of the things that stood out to me. And if you've read it. It's always good worth it's always worth reading a good book a second time to refresh your mind. So if you've read it, maybe this series or book review study can help you bring some of those things back to your memory. because uh, the word of God is always is always alive. And so I'm gonna be reading, I'm gonna be reviewing some things that stood out, and then I'll also be uh, pulling out scriptures that we can also use to, to scrape out some of the things or to give us more awareness and understanding. So, so Father, in the name of Jesus, I just want to pray for all of us that are listening to this, including myself, Lord, that as we journey through this study material, that truly, truly, our hearts will be touched 
we understand that the journey of sanctification is a process. And many times as Christians, we have tried to bury down old hearts, damaged emotions, traumas, disappointments, regrets, and they're all seated at the bottom of our hearts. So Holy Spirit, I ask you that the first work you do right now is to uncover, take the dirt off, take all the graveyard dirt that we have put on top of the, on top of on top of these on top of these old traumas and hearts and disappointments and condemnations. Help us dig them out from as far down as we have buried them. Bring them to the surface, O oh Lord. Um, by, by the power of the Holy Ghost right now, what we're asking is bring everything to the surface. Bring it to the surface, Lord. And may you start to touch us and heal us. May you, first of all, give us the confidence to say, to accept them. You know, many a times when Jesus would come, he would ask people, what shall I do for you? How, how would you, why would you just ask someone who's blind, what can I do for you? Why would you just ask someone who's lame, what can I do for you? Because in acknowledgement, we signal that we need the power of God to flow into the area. So Lord, I ask everyone, you touch our hearts right now. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge that these perhaps healings that we need, things that we've hidden deep down in our hearts. And we ask for intervention right now. May your power come in right now mightily. And may you start healing us. May you start. I really feel like for the first segment, let's ask for an activation of acknowledgement. That yes, I need help. I need help. I need help. We put aside the guilt, the shame, and the condemnation that Christians cannot have such problems. That Christians cannot have mental health. That Christians cannot be tormented in their minds. It says the power of Jesus, it says Jesus was anointed by the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus of Nazareth was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went about doing good healing all who are oppressed of the devil. Damaged emotions is oppression from the devil. The devil wants us to stay in an area of heart and trauma, disappointment, condemnation, as you'll see. So Father, we ask right now that you give us strength to arise off the ground and say enough is enough. I am ready to be healed and I receive your healing touch. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Man. This is going to be fun. We promise that we will be bringing different types of content. This is the JAEF Media Show. Uh, we're going to bring different kinds of content. Uh, series and different things. Teachings and who knows. Movies. Uh, speaking that I am speaking that prophetically. Uh, shows, other kind of shows. I don't know. Um, I am open. Whatever the Lord wants to do through this voice and channel, we are open. Lord, we are open. So, thank you so much. And um, just to close us out, a fitting benediction. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who called you is faithful, who also will do it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Your host for today was Calvin Cabanda. We hope this episode blessed your heart. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you from the evil one. Thank you for tuning in to this show today. See you on the next episode.
Goodbye.